Um, right. So again, thank you all for joining us for this important event, event that we have going on here today. Um, a little bit about our, our presenter, uh, Julian Gaeta is a New York City history teacher. Um, she primarily teaches um, grades five through 12, um, but as of now, she is the director of history for uh, four middle schools in Brooklyn and Rhode Island. Um, and so we're really happy that she could join us and share what she's learned about this. And so without further ado, we've got a lot to get through. So let me turn it over to Jillian. And uh, if you guys have any uh, comments or anything, then please put them into the chat um, and we will stop and, and make time to answer as many of them as we can. And uh, so without further ado, Jillian, take it away. Great, thank you so much for um, having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to um, present and um, just really thrilled to be able to talk about this topic with you. Um, so recently, um, my colleagues and I founded a new organization called Roots to Revolution, um, and we'll talk more about this at the end, but if you are interested in learning more about tonight's presentation and learning more about this history, um, you can find us. But what we found, which is really inspiring in this time, is that so many people are interested in learning more about the United States history in order to dismantle um, systemic oppression. And so we're, we believe that we need to learn our roots um, as a society in order to be activists, um, in order to um, revolt <laughs> effectively and overthrow some of the systems that exist. And so tonight I'm gonna talk through um, a lot about American history, but of course, uh, just to give you some perspective, like I teach, you know, I've taught AP US history and I've taught history to grad students and there's never enough time to teach all the history. So I certainly can't teach you everything in one hour. Um, but what I hope I can do tonight is dispel some of the myths about American history, um, teach you some of the things that you may not knew, that may not have known before, that will um, help you make sense of the current moment that we're in. Um, and then hopefully I can be a resource to you as you go on this journey and look to learn some more. Um, so I want to start with um, indigenous nations and the people who were in North America uh, before the arrival of Europeans. And I, I want to refer to them as nations, and that is a deliberate word choice that I'm using. Oftentimes, many people refer to them as tribes. Um, and that's a misconception because they were actually vast, complex, um, very elaborate societies. Um, and they were on the continent from 8500 BCE all the way up to um, 1492. There were at least 500 different um, complex nations that existed. And there was a population between 7 million to 18 million people who lived here. And native nations were not roaming the forest. Um, they were widespread complex cities. I think there is this misconception that people have about tribes um, just kind of existing and that was not the case. And the cities had populations that rivaled Paris and London at the time. And if you look at the pictures here, they were more spread out. And so when the Europeans came, they assumed that this was open space that they could uh, take over. And that, was, that wasn't the case. Um, but when the Europeans came, so much of what they brought with them was smallpox. Um, and when we think about right now, we're living through a pandemic and these populations in these cities got infected with smallpox. And that led to destruction of the native population and it led to um, genocide. And many of the colonists who were establishing colonies here uh, were not able to um, enslave the native nations as effectively as they would have liked to um, for labor because they knew the land so well and because this was their home and also because so many had died from smallpox. And so that was when the um, slave trade began and the Middle Passage began and 17 million um, sorry, uh, 8 million Africans were taken for, um, during the Middle Passage and 2 million were killed. And so I think when I often think about America, um, we're talking about America being founded on, on two genocides, right? First, the genocide of Native nations, and second, the genocide that took place um, during the Middle Passage. Something else that I would like to talk about is some of the gender roles that existed in Native um, nations. So Indigenous people were unique throughout the continent. And so I'm just gonna to touch on a few different, um, three different nations in specific. Um, and one is the Iroquois Confederacy in upstate New York, and they had many of the strong foundations for democracy. And so there is this 
misconception that a lot of our democratic ideas came from Greece and Rome, and, and they did, but they also came from the Iroquois because they were our neighbors. And, and Benjamin Franklin spent a lot of time um, with them and learning from them. And that is where we adopted a lot of our ideas and where he got a lot of his ideas for democracy. And in the Southwest, um, the Pueblo tribe allowed women to have a vast amount of sexual um, freedom and women did not do household chores and marriage was a construct, um, but divorce, however, was not a construct. So there was a belief that, you know, if a, if a relationship came to an end, it came to an end and that was okay. Um, there was also an understanding that there could be um, sexual fluidity and, um, and non-monogamy in relationships in the Pueblo tribe. Um, and there were, there were a lot of homoerotic relationships in um, a lot of these tribes. And another piece of information that I wanna share with you is also about the Navajo. And so the Navajo, if you see in that picture, um, they had coined this term called two-spirit. And what they meant by that is that people fluidly um, change their gender. And I bring that up because I think when we think about today's society and we think about um, structures of patriarchy that are also linked to racism, um, that didn't always exist. That was something that Europeans constructed and Europeans brought over um, to our continent. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so the United States was founded with two major um, colonies in the beginning. So one was in 1607 in Jamestown, and the other was the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1629. Um, Jamestown was founded on capitalism. Most of the people who came, from James, came to Jamestown were single men, and their primary goal was to um, grow tobacco. And like I said earlier, Jamestown was largely responsible for importing slaves. And the first time um, enslaved people arrived in the United States was 1619. And the reason they did that was because they couldn't enslave people in the Powhatan tribe. Massachusetts Bay was founded by the Puritans. And I think um, a lot of people think, well, the Puritans came here because they were facing religious persecution. And that was true, um, but there's a little bit of that story that we leave out about the Puritans, which the Puritans were a very fanatical religious group. Um, they were people who left in England because they thought Henry VIII was too liberal. And I'm not an expert on British history, uh, but Henry VIII was the king, if you recall, who was known to kill many of his wives, right? So to think about Henry VIII as being too liberal gives you a sense of how conservative the Puritans really actually were. And the Puritans founded Harvard. Um, they believed in hard work. They believed that women were property of their husbands. Um, and they also, they believed in sexual repression and they believed that they were morally superior to all others. Um, and so those things had a strong impact on the United States. And when I think about sexual repression, one of the things that happened frequently in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, because you actually can't repress your sexual desires, um, the Puritans acted those sexual desires out on the women that they enslaved. And so women who were, um, enslaved in the Massachusetts Bay Colony were frequently victims of rape. And then um, the Puritans would blame it on them, saying that the women had over-sexualized them and um, brought them to sin. And I think that is super relevant to mention today because one of the problems that many Black women experience is a hypersexualization um, and have often been victims of rape and violence. And that goes all the way back to our founding. Um, another important point, and you can see in that uh, quote there, that the Puritans did believe they were morally superior, and they believed that they needed to um, convert people to Christianity. And in the founding of Harvard, um, there were a lot of, uh, there was portions of the school that were dedicated to um, converting the Narragansett tribe and the Pequot tribe um, to Christianity and stripping them of their culture. And that was another way in which they eradicated um, these groups of people. And the Puritans did en enslave people. Um, the Northern colonies did enslave people. Every single colony in the United States had 
um, slavery. And I think that's something that's really important to um, think about because it, slavery was not a Southern problem. Our whole um, country really benefited from it. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, in 1793, the cotton gin was created and that drastically increases the demand for slavery. And so the economy switches from a tobacco-based economy and, and really goes to a cotton-based economy. And sometimes we think of technology as making things easier so people can do less work, but because the cotton gin sped up the production of um, cotton, they wanted to enslave more people in order to do that. And so cotton becomes the dominant cash crop that was, um, throughout the United States. And the phrase becomes King Cotton because everyone is so reliant on slavery. And as you can see from the map, right, um, as the United States expands westward, um, that land is used for plantations. So Thomas Jefferson in 1803, after the Haitian Revolution, um, gains land from Napoleon, land that was um, lands from Native American nations, and they clear that land for plantations. And so we see the country, again, killing one group of people in order to enslave another. And I think what is also important to recognize is that uh, cotton was manufactured in the North. So Wall Street was a literal wall at first, and that wall was built by enslaved people. Um, Wall Street was the the end of Wall Street. If you've been to New York or been to Wall Street, is um, all water and right, and that's where people came in. Um, that's also where the cotton went out. Um, so it was, you know, it was being picked in the South, but then it was shipped to the North to be traded um, through the Northern cities. And so Northern cities um, were merchants who largely benefited from slavery as well. And so to give you kind of an understanding of this, like when we think about our colleges as well, um, Princeton was a school that was largely um, financed by slave, um, slave traders because Princeton had dorms. So a lot of um, slave traders and slave owners um, sent their children to go to Princeton because they, can bring, they could bring their enslaved people with them. And Columbia, which was known as King's College at the time, um, was a merchant school. And most of the people who were there were merchants who had, who had ties to the slave trade. Um, and something that I found to be really fascinating and just indicative of how much the North benefited from slavery. Um, I did when I was in college to pay my tuition work at the New York Stock Exchange um, and made me realize that I did not want to work in finance, um, but it was a great experience. And I used to give tours of the trading floor and they told me um, to point out to people that the goods that are on the top of the ceiling of the, of the trading floor are um, cotton and tobacco and it's in gold plate. And the reason why cotton and tobacco are on the ceiling is because those were the first commodities traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And so American capitalism is directly tied to racism. And that is unique in our country. Um, not all capitalism is tied to racism across the world, but in the United States it is. And so when we think about that in the modern context, that is why so many people are calling for reparations um, because so much of our economy was built by enslaved people and so much of our wealth was, a, was accumulated because of enslaved people, but never given to them. Um, so I wanna just stop at this point um, before we start talking about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, because I just gave you a lot of information. Um, and I'm just wondering if anyone has any questions um, before we continue. It looks like the main question right now is just, are the slides gonna be available afterwards? Uh, can, people, can people get their hand on these? Oh um, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can send those out to you, yes. <laughs> Awesome. Great. Yeah, we'll Great. definitely send those out then. <laughs> okay. Am I speaking too quickly? Because I tend to do that. So I just want to make sure. Uh, there's so much to get through. I think you're okay. good so far. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the American Revolution and um, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Um, so first, let's start with the roots of the American Revolution. Um, the 
French and Indian War was from 1754 to 1763. And that was a war between the British and the French, but also with um, the Algonquin nation and the Iroquois nation. Um, the Iroquois sided with the British and the Algonquin sided with the French. And one thing to also keep in mind about a lot of these native nations was they knew the colonial powers were encroaching on their land, um, but they also were diplomats. And so they were trying to figure out how to negotiate their territory with them. And the French were more amicable with the people who were there on the, on the continent already because the French did not want to leave. I mean, did not want to stay. Um, the French did not want to really stay for a long time on the continent. And so they were just more interested in trade, whereas the, and I'm making a generalization here, whereas the British did want to stay on the continent. Um, so when France lost the Seven Years' War, that was a really devastating blow to the native nations for two reasons. One was because in the French, they had a slightly more benevolent colonial power. Um, and they also no longer were able to negotiate that diplomacy and play the colonial powers off of one another. Another huge consequence of that was um, Britain went into debt because wars are expensive. Um, Britain was also fighting many other wars, maintaining other colonial powers. And so they enacted a series of taxes on the colonies. Um, and that's why the colonial elites um, rebelled because they did not want to pay those taxes. However, at that time, they also realized that a lot of the lower class citizens were not going to be invested in a war that was about taxation. And so the founding fathers shifted the language in the Declaration of Independence to be about enlightenment thinking and to be about natural rights and independence in order to galvanize the masses to fight the war. Um, because they also you know, quite frankly, some of the founding fathers fought in the war, um, but a lot of them did not because they they didn't want to do that kind of work. Um, and so I think that's that's a big part, important part to remember about the Declaration of Independence. Um, it's also important to note that Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Um, George Washington was an enslaver. Um, they, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson had, um, after his wife died, he had a relationship with Sally Hemings, who was one of his enslaved um, women on his, on his plantation in Monticello, and he had children with her. And when Thomas Jefferson died, he freed his children, but not uh, Sally Hemings. And so there's a lot of hypocrisy that goes along with um, the Declaration, Declaration of Independence and its, and its language. And also, um, a close friend of Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Banneker, who was an architect and is responsible for designing Washington, D.C., um, he wrote to Jefferson, he was a free black man, and he you know, called out the hypocrisy of the Declaration of Independence and called out the hypocrisy of the Constitution. And so I, I say that because very early on there were people resisting and people who were abolitionists. Um, so to talk about the Constitution, um, we the people, is what was written into the preamble of the Constitution, but really it was just we, the rich, wealthy, white men, um, because the only people who could be voting at the Constitutional Convention were white uh, property owners. And if you look at the column, um, these are the years in which these people gained suffrage in the United States. And I put Black women in 1965. Um, legally, Black women could vote in 1920. Um, but because of Jim Crow laws, because of grandfather clauses and poll taxes and the literacy tests that were in the South, um, full enfranchisement wasn't possible until the Voter Rights Act was passed in 1965. And I'm sure as some of you have heard, even currently today in America, um, there are many ways in which people are, their vote is being suppressed. And most of those places where voting is being suppressed are communities of color. So to talk a little bit about slavery in the Constitution. Um, there were people at the Constitutional Convention who believed that slavery should be abolished, who were voting members of the Constitutional Convention, um, but they realized that the nation couldn't become unified with the Southern states if they abolished slavery, and so they decided not to. Um, and the compromises that they came to really did not benefit um, Black Americans. So they said that they were going to abolish the slave trade in 1808, even though the Constitution was ratified in 1789. So they kind of pushed that off to another group of people to deal with. 
Um, they also passed the Fugitive Slave Act, which said that anyone who had um, escaped to a free black state um, needed to be returned back to their colonies. There were some states by the time of the Constitutional Convention who had already abolished slavery, Vermont being one of them. Um, and they also passed something known as the Three-Fifths Compromise, which was that for every five people who were enslaved, three would count towards the population. And this was a way for the Southern states to increase their representation in the colonies, um, in, I mean, in, the, in the United States, and get more representatives in the House of Representatives. Just want to pause there and see if there's any questions or concerns. We, we do have a couple of questions. And so um, one is backing up uh, a bit to the colonial days, did the European countries enslave as well? Um, did the Puritans bring that practice with them from, from their native country? Yeah, so um, so Portugal was the first nation to start um, the slave trade. And so Portugal, Britain, France, um, Spain were all countries that participated in the slave in the slave trade, um, Belgium. And so what, but it looked different for all of those places. And um, it also looked different in the way it was enacted here. So the Spanish who colonized a lot of the Southwest um, before we took it over and California, New Mexico, um, Mexico, they had something known as the encomienda system, which was a hierarchy of people with the lightest skinned people being at the top. Um, and so they also enslaved um, native peoples in all of those communities. Um, the French did not participate in enslaving Native Americans, but they did participate in the slave trade and colonized in, in Africa. Um, I mean, we're not going to talk about it in this lecture, but I mean, a fascinating, um, devastatingly brutal story is of King Leopold in, Bel in Belgium, um, in the Belgian Congo, and, and, the, and what he did was some of the most gruesome pieces of the uh, slave trade when he was um, colonizing for, for rubber. Um, so, you know, they definitely all had that. I think the difference, though, between other colonial places in the United States is that none of the colonial powers really ever had to um, live with the people they were enslaving. And so we have a very unique and different relationship to enslavement um, that has led to a lot of persecution um, because we were together, right? So when you think, when I, what, I'm, what I mean by that is like, the British had set up colonies in, in Jamaica and the French had set up colonies in Haiti and all these places, but so many people in France and, and Britain were away from that. And so their, their racism looks different. And I think that um, that's something really important to think about when we think about racism is that racism is a construct. And so every country constructs their racism in a different way. Um, and that construct becomes very real, but because it was created by laws and hierarchies, um, it does look different. So it's hard to compare those constructs. Um, the only other nation that has like the, the, a very similar construct of racism to ours is South Africa in the apartheid system is very similar to the racial, racial construct. And they modeled a lot of their um, apartheid system after the United States. Yeah, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was both that they didn't live near each other and um, the quantity after the cotton gin was invented that it just brought way more um, slaves over. Um, right. So, um, <clears throat> one other one, another one, there was a, um, people are wondering the difference between enslaver and slave owner. Yeah, and I'm actually still working on making myself um, like practice the word enslaver more. Um, I think words matter, and I think we've been ingrained to hear like slave owner, which treat someone as property, whereas when you say an enslaver, that's like a different word that doesn't indicate like as much of a human being being property. Um, and so I try to use that. And I also try to use the word like enslaved um, person versus slave, which is a noun. Um, and so I think, and the same thing, I did the same thing with native nations versus tribes. But I think even, you know, we're all working on this as a white person. I think I often slip up because we've been ingrained in that. So I'm working on <laughs> using those words in a better way. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really um, important question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, was the U.S. the last nation country to end the slave trade? No, um, Brazil was. Um, 
Brazil had this had slavery the longest and actually um what was interesting was that a lot of confederates after the civil war was over they relocated to Brazil so they can continue to um enslave people and what uh when did other people of color um asian americans and latinx get the right to vote um yeah so that would have happened like as they became citizens. And so um, what happened in the United States is like you would have to apply to become a citizen as you immigrated over. Um, and so that was a different process. But I think when we think about like whiteness in America, um, a lot of what you had to do to prove legally that you could become a citizen was that you had adopted white culture. Um, so a lot of those people who came over gave up their cultures and gave up their languages and, and gave up things um, in order to become citizens. But it Great. wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a specific date like the other groups of people. And um, when was the Fugitive Slave Act enacted? So that was enacted as soon as the Constitution was enacted. And then um, in the Civil War, it became um, more severe. And that really was what led to the Civil War breaking out. All right. Um, and this one, also the last one, um, did the Native Americans have the right to vote from the start? No. And so, um, something that was also interesting was Benjamin Franklin did invite some of the chiefs from the Iroquois um, Confederacy to the Constitutional Convention. They couldn't vote there. And one of the things that they said was they asked him, where are your women? Um, and they were really shocked that there were no women at the Constitutional Convention. Um, so Native American tribes like fully didn't get their citizen right, ships rights and the rights to vote until 1921. Those who assimilated um, did, right? So that process of assimilation where you were giving up your culture, giving up your languages. Um, there were boarding schools for the, for the Cherokee and for other groups of people to try to assimilate. They got voting rights ahead of time, um, but full citizenship and full suffrage wasn't granted until 21. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, why don't we move on? And I apologize to anyone if I missed your questions, but we'll try and get back to them. Great. <laughs> um, so yeah, and something I want to talk about a little bit and quickly um, is the War of 1812. So I think a lot of us don't know much about the War of 1812, but I didn't want to bring it up because I think it has a lot of relevance to today's um, society. So the national anthem was um, written during the War of 1812. And I think something a lot of people don't know about the War of 1812 was there were a lot of battles in Canada because um, John Calhoun, who was a senator, wanted to expand slavery and he was a war hawk. Um, and he, we lost a lot of those battles in Canada, even though we won the war against the British. Uh, but if we had won those battles in Canada, Canada might also have had experienced an expansion of slavery. Um, and Francis Scott Key, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, was pro-slavery. Um, and he recruited black soldiers, um, the British had recruited black soldiers to fight in the United States. For the, against the United States in a regiment known as the Colonel Marines. And Francis Scott Key included a third verse in the Star Spangled Banner um, about slavery. And it talked about how he hoped that the blood of the slaves would wash away the pollution that the British have brought. Um, and so I bring this up because I think there's been a lot of debate and rhetoric in the country about NFL players taking a knee during the national anthem. Um, and our national anthem was founded um, by a pro-slavery man um, for a war that was about, in many ways, expanding slavery um, and includes a part that we don't sing anymore, but its original lines do have lyrics about slavery. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind um, when we think about people who are, are protesting. So I, I did bring that up so you can have that little tidbit of information. Um, so another reason why American slavery um, was so, actually I'm gonna start, yeah, was so violent um, was that even though the slave trade was abolished in 1808, um, something took place known as the Second Middle Passage, which was that women were um, raped and encouraged to breed um, more people in order to continue slavery. Um, so that was an extremely brutal piece of American history. So even that is why 
um, so much of American slavery has expanded. Um, I also have listed, there is a, I think there's a, a misconception that people who were enslaved um, didn't fight back and they did in so many different ways. Um, th this is a list of violent slave rebellions that took place. Um, and all of those in those cases, um, they like burned things down to the ground. Um, they destroyed property. Um, in other ways, there were abolitionists who um, fought through their narratives and their memoirs. Um, they formed anti-slavery societies. A lot of the music that people who were enslaved sung um, was an act of resistance. They, on the plantations, they worked much more slowly as an act of resistance. They also worked to maintain uh, culture and create traditions. And even though they weren't allowed to legally marry, they had traditions like jumping over the broom to get married and and all kinds of things to, to keep themselves as viewed as human beings. And all of that is an act of resistance. And I think that um, so much of our culture and our art and our history um, come from those pieces of resistance. And there were also white people in the United States who were allies um, and were abolitionists. And one of those were the Quakers. Um, the Quakers were a group of pacifists who existed in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania was one of the earlier states to abolish slavery. Um, and they were really helpful in forming the anti-slavery society along with Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And that led to the Underground Railroad. Um, and so I think sometimes we think about like Harriet Tubman being the only one that brought people up to the North. And it was a really widespread, intricate um, form of resistance that took many people risking their lives. Um, so I'm going to jump a little bit ahead to um, Abraham Lincoln. And I think one some, something that's really important to know is that when Abraham Lincoln um, was running for president and when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, he was not an abolitionist. Um, so if you look at these two quotes um, from Lincoln, right, he says, if I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. So Lincoln's primary goal was preserving the union, he was not interested in slavery expanding, um, but he certainly wasn't an abolitionist. He wasn't interested in getting rid of the institution where it stood. Um, Lincoln also did believe that a good option for um, Black Americans was to have colonization, um, so to send them back home um, home to Africa was his idea. Of course, that idea um, really didn't make any sense when we think about, now we're talking about, and Lincoln was elected in 1860, people had come over for, had ancestors who came over in 1619, right? So Ghana and Senegal, um, places where people were leaving, um, certainly weren't their homes anymore. Um, and that was, those were the beliefs that Lincoln originally held. As the war went on, um, Lincoln was pushed by abolitionists to believe in the cause. Um, when he issued the emancipation proclamation in, in 1863, it freed the slaves in the Confederacy. Um, it didn't, um, so it didn't, in um, some of the states did not participate in the Civil War. Those were known as the border states. And so enslaved people in the border states were not um, set free. And the reason why Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation was because the North was losing a lot of the major battles and he needed more military support. And he thought that if he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he would get that support. Um, and so that's why he passed the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, okay. And so right before Lincoln gets assassinated, um, he works with the Radical Republican Party um, and the 13th Amendment is passed. And the 13th Amendment does not fully end slavery in the United States. So if you look at, this is the text directly from the amendment. And if you look at the part that I have bolded out, right? So neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So what happens with the 13th amendment is Southern states find that loophole, that part that I bolded out. Um, and this is when the criminalization of black men and women really starts. 
So they start um, arresting people for small crimes, um, for vagrancy. There were all kinds of vagrancy laws. There were all kinds of laws around separation. Um, and they start to arrest them for those crimes, which leads to convict lease labor and the beginnings of um, mass incarceration. And it is through that system that they're able to maintain a form of slavery. Um, another way that they were able to maintain a form of slavery was through sharecropping. And so sharecropping was when you, um, you still needed to live on a plantation and give your owner um, back money for the land and you just sign contracts with your um, enslaver in or former enslaver in order to um, live on the land. And so these contracts of sharecropping never allowed people to really get out of the system of enslavement. And so it was called slavery by another name. Um, and that lasted in some states all the way through the 1970s. Um, and so when we think about opportunities for economic prosperity, it really did not exist. Um, a part of Reconstruction, though, that I think is important to recognize is the possibility that existed, even though it was a very short amount of time. Um, so during Reconstruction, after the 15th Amendment passed, there were many Black politicians that were elected at every single level of government. And so this is um, Black office holders for Reconstruction by state. And if you look, there were um, 1,517 um, representatives in the government. Um, and this is a picture of Hiram Relvilles, who was the first Black man elected to um, Congress. And so when given the opportunity for suffrage, um, Black Americans catapulted into power. Um, and that is really what scared a lot of the Southern leaders. And so at this time, that's when you see the, the birth of the KKK. Um, and they start targeting anyone who is running for office and anyone who supports um, people running for office. And they start passing laws to erode the 15th Amendment. So one of those was uh, grandfather clauses, meaning that you couldn't vote unless your grandfather could vote, which of course, if your grandfather was enslaved, he couldn't vote. So that doesn't make any sense. Um, there were literacy tests. And it wasn't just like if you could read literacy tests. They were like um, games that people played with them. So for example, I think a great example is in the movie Selma, if you've ever seen it. She goes to take her literacy test and she has to name every single person in the Alabama State House. Um, now I love politics. I can't name every single person in the New York State House. And then when she does, because she memorizes everyone, they ask her to give them all their middle names. Um, so it was things like that that they discourage people from voting. Um, the KKK would also go to the polls. And um, then you also had to pay a tax in order to vote. Um, so those were the things that. Um, we think about the civil rights movement, that's what they were trying to break down in, in the South, in addition to segregation, were those barriers to voting. Um, so all of these things are happening during Reconstruction. Um, in 1877, the Northern federal government had military troops in the South to protect people, um, and they pull out the federal troops out of the South um, and then this leads to widespread lynching. Um, it leads to the erosion of any of the protections that were put in place during Reconstruction um, because the federal troops are removed and the military is removed. And so in 1877, when the federal government does that, so much of what had been achieved during Reconstruction um, vanishes. And all of those politicians are removed from office um, and we see all of that being um, diminished. And the woman you see on the screen, her name is Ida B. Wells, and she's she's gotten more attention in recent years, but she had she had been frequently overlooked. Um, and she wrote one of the most powerful narratives. Her two of her friends were lynched, and she starts to study all the lynching in the South. And she writes um, a book called On Southern Lynching and exposes all the things that happened in the South. And herself, along with W. E. B. Du Bois, they go on to found the NAACP in 1909. And Du Bois is the first black man to ever get his PhD from Harvard. And he writes about black reconstruction and he talks about a lot of these issues and both of them um, were champions for civil rights in, in that time period. Um, so during the 1920s- If I can, if I can butt in here a minute. Um, we just had a couple of questions. Um, 
one, uh, I guess sort of for me, um, the we talk about reconstruction a little bit, um, but I know from what I've learned about it, then, you know, there was right after the Civil War was the period when they were trying to rebuild the South and they had taken a lot of the white leaders out of power and things that had, had stood up and um, that was reconstruction. And that's when the uh, black politicians were allowed to be put into power. Is that right? Yeah. And I think there's also like a, a um, you know, a story of agency that I want to push, which is that like they all wanted to be in power, right? There's like this, and I think right. that's true yeah. of, you know, today, right? The highest voting electorate um, in the country is black women, right? People, when given the opportunity, um, really pushed for it and didn't take those rights for granted. And I should have mentioned this, but the only reparations that were ever given in the um, after the Civil War were 40 acres and a mule to people. Um, there were radical Republicans who were arguing for reparations. Frederick Douglass argued for reparations. Um, but the people who got them also were Southern plantation owners. So plantation owners got reparations for having lost um, the money from the people that were enslaved. Right. Yeah. And then uh, another question is, can you talk about Juneteenth um, a little bit and why that's important? Yes. So um, when the Emancipation Proclamation um, was passed, that was in 1863, and um, the Texans wanted uh, to maintain another harvest. So a lot of the Texans who were enslaved couldn't read or write, and so they couldn't actually read that the proclamation had been issued. And so um, the Texans didn't let them know that that had been passed. So technically, they should have been freed. Um, and they didn't tell them. And so it wasn't until 1865 that they found out this, this news. And that was, um, it's recognized on Juneteenth, um, which was when they finally realized in 1865 that they were um, no longer enslaved. But there were still people, you know, throughout the country who had been enslaved, which is why the 13th Amendment, you know, formally abolishes slavery. But then, as I talked about, we have the slavery of another name through convict lease labor and, and, and sharecropping. But that's why Juneteenth is, and, that, and you might see some shirts out there. I don't know if you've seen this, but like I've seen a lot of black women with shirts that say like free-ish since 1865, right? That's why they're saying free-ish um, because it was technically the date when people were free, um, but so many other things have gotten in the way of that. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so to talk a little bit about the 1920s, um, the 1920s was a time period of progress, right? World War I had just ended in 1917. Um, and what you see happening is a lot of um, industrialization taking place. And so people start fleeing the South in what is known as the Great Migration. Um, and if you're interested in this time period, I can't recommend enough um, a book called The Warmth of Other Suns by uh, Elizabeth Wilkerson. And she um, studies people who moved from the Great Migration. And, and what she talks about is how, um, how much talent left the South and what that means for us because they didn't have to become sharecroppers. So for example, um, Diana Ross's parents were sharecroppers who moved to the North and then that's when she was able to get into music. Um, Michelle Obama's grandparents were, were sharecroppers who um, moved to the North. Jesse Owens' parents were sharecroppers who then moved to the North. And so, so much of this people were like refugees, right? They were trying to escape um, the lynching and the terror that was in the South to move to Northern cities. However, when they got to Northern cities, as you can imagine, they were not like wide open and welcomed. And we'll talk about that in a second. But also during the 1920s was the Harlem Renaissance and this time of like artistic achievement and liberation. Um, so poets like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, and there was a movement of black nationalism um, that happened during this time. And, and you just see a lot of art and culture. Madam C.J. Walker um, was the first black woman to become a millionaire um, and she, you know, designed hair care products. So you see this like surge of um, black excellence. And this is a picture by Jacob Lawrence who documented all of the pieces of the great migration art and, and just so much culture that grew um, during this time that was extremely progressive. And I think sometimes we think about the 1920s as the time of like Ernest Hemingway and the great Gatsby and, and all of that existed. Uh, but there was also monumental great black achievement that was happening at this, at this period. Um, but when people got to Northern cities, um, they were faced with racism and people did not want them there. And so one example of that was the Chicago race riots. 
um, and it became known as the Red Summer in 1919. Um, and so, which is eerie to me because it's almost like a century ago that we were seeing this, but a young boy was on the beach and the beach was segregated and he crossed over onto the wrong side of the beach because he had thrown a rock over to the wrong side of the beach. He was about eight years old um, and he was lynched. And that set off a series of riots in, in Chicago. They were, they were bombing people's houses, um, white people in black neighborhoods. Um, and then there were riots that were sparked throughout the country. And then I, you've, you might have gotten a little bit more information about the Tulsa race riots recently, um, recently because Donald Trump had just was going to have a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth, um, which has a heavy significance because of the history that exists in Tulsa. Um, so right outside of Tulsa was a, was a neighborhood called the Greenwood neighborhood. Um, and a 19 year old man named Dick Rowland um, lived in that neighborhood. And the Greenwood neighborhood was also known as Black Wall Street because it was full of doctors and lawyers and extremely well-educated, middle-class, wealthy um, Black professionals who were really, really thriving. Um, and Dick Rowland was a shoe shiner and he worked in the building and because of segregation, he couldn't go to the bathroom in his building. Um, so he had to leave his building to go to a, a, a Black bathroom around the corner. And um, a woman who was running the elevator claimed that he raped her. Um, her story changed four or five times. Um, they never took his story and they arrested him. And so men who were former World War I veterans who lived in the Greenwood ne neighborhood, they went down to the courthouse with their, arm, their arms and said, not in a violent way, but said, we, we wanna just be here to protect him because we're afraid he's gonna get lynched. And of course, they wouldn't allow them to do that, so they go back to Greenwood. And then what happened was the police were called um, and the white people in the neighborhood had it suspected that the KKK was also involved. Um, they went to the Greenwood neighborhood and they completely um, destroyed the neighborhood. Um, so the people fled Tulsa um, and they burned down all their houses, they destroyed all their property, people were left homeless. Um, and it was never able to recover. And so this is a strong example of white um, race riots that, that started and looting that started during that time. And so when Donald Trump announced that he was gonna have a rally in Tulsa at a spot where um, it was a, a scene of um, siege on black people and black excellence by white people um, on Juneteenth, that's why people were so angry. Um, and that's why he changed it to Saturday, the day after Juneteenth. Um, so also during this time in the 1920s, you see a surge of the KKK because there is all this progress and all this black excellence. Um, and Woodrow Wilson supported that. There's a movie that came out during um, this time called Birth of the Nation and Woodrow Wilson um, had a screening of Birth of the Nation during this time and Birth of the Nation um, gl glamorizes the KKK and this idea of the lost cause. Um, and the lost cause is this idea that like the South didn't secede because of slavery. The lost cause is this idea that the South seceded because of states' rights, which they did not. And if you look at the secession documents, all of them say we are seceding because of the state right to maintain the institution of slavery. Um, but what happened in the 1920s is they wanted to rewrite this story because people were starting to die off who had served in the Confederacy. And so birth of the nation, was one way to revitalize that story. Um, another was this group called the Daughters of the Confederacy, which is, you see these women picture here, and they were um, extremely wealthy, upper-class women in the South who were responsible for all the Confederate statues that we see um, throughout the South. And they raised a lot of money to make sure that those Confederate statues um, were maintained. And that's where a lot of that um, comes from. And I think that sometimes, you know, I bring this up because I think that, uh, I think a lot of times women, we're often thinking that feminism goes hand in hand with anti-racism and it doesn't always, um, especially white feminism. Um, and so in the 1930s, um, when the Great Depression hits and FDR takes over and the New Deal happens, um, we have something known as like a, what I call when affirmative action was white. Um, so the Social Security Act was passed, um, but the Social Security Act did not apply to anyone who was a tenant farmer, so a sharecropper, and did not apply to anyone who was a domestic worker. Um, so when you think about 
who were the majority of farmers and domestic workers, um, they were all black people. So the argument that the NAACP put out was that the Social Security Act didn't help these people. So we see white people progressing um, and getting support from welfare, getting support from the Social Security Act, getting ahead with all these things, and black people are not. Another example of that is the GI Bill. Um, so when people returned home from the war, they were given money to go to school. Um, veterans were given money to get a mortgage. Blacks were ex excluded from that. Um, and then in the 1950s, when people were moving to the suburbs, um, people made sure that those suburbs were segregated. And even as far as um, in New York, if you drive through Long Island, um, the arches are really low. Um, a bus can't get through, and that was designed that way um, so that people of color couldn't make it out to the suburbs because they traveled through bus transportation more frequently than white people did. Um, in the 1940s, the Ma March on Washington was proposed by a, name, by, uh, a man named Philip Randolph, um, and the reason why it was canceled um, was because it was agreed upon to um, desegregate the military and to desegregate the federal government. Um, but this idea of having a march um, started right after World War II and it was for economic freedoms. And I bring that up because I want to continue for us to remember that resistance lasted throughout the history of America, um, right? It is a story of constant resistance. Um, it didn't start and stop at any point. We see resistance at every single point in American history. Um, Martin Luther King was a radical, right? So Martin Luther King starts to come about, and this is one of my, if you, if you read anything in your life about anti-racism, please read a letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, and this is from that letter where he talks about the white moderate. Um, and he, he says, first I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride for freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is devoted to order, more to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with you in your methods of direct action. And so I, I think that that shows a lot of what King um, believed. And King, he believed in nonviolence, um, but this idea that he was just a pacifist or didn't see violence as a means to an end is not accurate. Um, and he also believes in economic rights, and that was a big reason why um, people came and, and, and went after him and killed him, um, because towards the end of his life, he started to become even more radical. Um, so he started to talk more about um, protesting the Vietnam War and how it was hypocritical of the United States government to be fighting for democracy in Vietnam but then sending our um, black men to die and then not giving them freedom at home. Um, and in his speech before he dies, the night before he dies, which is also very biblical because he, he it's believed that he thought he was going to get assassinated. Um, he talks about economic rights. Um, and you can see here that he was, he was fighting in Memphis for the sanitation workers um, who were living in poverty. And he starts to think a lot about poverty and about uplifting the black community through economic rights. And he's not that different than Malcolm X. Um, Malcolm X also, um, if you read from the ballot or the, um, to the ballot to the bullet, um, the ballot or the bullet is Malcolm X's, one of his most famous, beautiful speeches. And he also talks about economic rights and, and black nationalism and restoring um, enfranchisement to the community and education. And the media pitted the two of them against each other because that was a convenient narrative to tell, to divide the movement. Um, but if you read those two speeches, um, they're both so many similarities that the both of them talk about. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that women of the civil rights era were um, extremely important. Um, these are just a few, um, but Angela Davis and Ella B Baker and Fannie Lou Hammer and and, and Polly Murray and Shirley Chisholm are just a few of the women who um, were behind the scenes running all the marches and, and talking about the Freedom Summer. And Angela Davis was a huge um, Black Panther and Shirley Chisholm was the first woman to ever run for president. 
um, Polly Murray is very, she's not widely known at all, um, but she helped co-found the National Organization for Women and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who um, fought for women's equal justice, based her um, legal arguments on the on Polly Murray's studies and because Polly Murray was a lawyer. Um, so we have a lot to thank for from the women who were part of the civil rights movement. Um, I'm running out of time. There's too much history. <laughs> I also want to just point out that the Black Panthers um, were also founded by lawyers, right? So the Black Panthers were started um, by Bobby Seale and Huey Newton and um, Stokely Carmichael. They were all lawyers who used to sit at traffic stops and read people their rights when they were pulled over by the police. Um, so there's this misnomer that the Black Panthers were violent. Um, and if you look at the Panthers platform, um, a big piece of their beliefs was education, um, community funding. Um, the reason why kids have free and reduced lunch in schools is because of the Black Panthers. Um, and the Black Panthers, while their founders were men, were um, like 80% plus um, women. And so a lot of the rights that we see coming from the black community um, were led by women. Hey Jillian, one uh, thing. Yeah. Um, first off, I'm totally not cutting you off. This is going as long as you want it to go. Um, so take your time, keep, keep talking. Um, we had, did have a couple of questions sort of going back sure. a little bit. Um, yeah. First one, when did the KKK start and uh, where did it originate? Um, I don't remember the exact year, I'm sorry, um, but it was in, it was during Reconstruction. So in that period of 1865 to, oh, it was after the 15th Amendment was passed. So the 15th Amendment was passed in 1867. So somewhere around that time, um, between 1867 and 1870, 1877, I'm really sorry that I don't remember the exact date. And I, I don't know the exact state either, um, but it was in the, in the deep South. Um. And another one, um, going back to like the statues of the Confederate generals, um, somebody wants to know the was was that done in part to soothe the South, the White South, um, a little bit. Um, I know that that after Lincoln was assassinated, certainly then there was some trying to balance and, and keep some of the the White South happy. Um, is, is was that part of that? So no, the Confederate statues were put up in the in the 1920s. Um, so that happened like it happened later, and the reason why it happened was because a lot of the Confederate soldiers were dying off, and they wanted to re remember them, um, and so they did that as a way to remember them. And they rewrote the textbooks um, to talk about this idea of the lost cause, and they took out the components of slavery. And a lot of those textbooks existed until um, the 1950s, which talked about like slavery as a benevolent institution um, and that you know that they were just leaving because of states' rights and not because of the institution of slavery. Right. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. And which, yeah, lots of support to keep going. So yeah, take your time. We're not going anywhere. Well, I'll finish. Until yeah, until I'll finish ready. on this <laughs> in this slide. Um, but I think it leads to that idea of state rights. Um, so Lee Atwater was a um, advisor to the Republican Party. Um, he was a, a, a influential advisor to Reagan, um, to George. Bush, um, and I'm not going to repeat his quote <laughs> because there's a lot of violent language in it, um, but basically what this quote at the top um, talks about is he realized that they needed to stop talking about things in terms of race terms in order to really actually disenfranchise the community. Um, they needed to start talking about was this idea of states' rights, because if we gave power back to the southern states, um, they would inherently take away the programs that the states would use to support black people like welfare. Um, it was called the Southern strategy. Um, and if you look at the bottom piece, which is Reagan's inaugural address, um, he talks a lot about um, the lawlessness of the black people and the criminalization of black people and the riots and the idea of states rights. And Ronald Reagan starts to bring that up um, quite a bit. And Ronald Reagan is a big proponent of the war on drugs. So he starts to arrest and criminalize um, men for petty crimes, um, for the arrest of marijuana and a lot of these issues. And they start to, and that continues, and I'm not just, you know, going after the Republicans, um, that continues with Bill Clinton in 1994 when he passes the crime bill. Um, bill Clinton referred to people as super predators. Um, and the idea that we needed to really crack down um, 
on small crimes in order to avoid big ones. And so this leads to the situation we're in today, which is um, mass incarceration and a lot of the big issues that we are having. Um, and so to go back to this idea of um, Black women and their voices and their power in society, um, the Black Lives Matter movement was founded by these three women when Trayvon um, Martin was killed in 2012. Um, their names are Patrice Cullors, um, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. Um, and they, I think people don't really know their names, that is deliberate because they want people to know that like, this is a movement um, and this isn't about three figureheads and not superhero people, that every individual can take action. Um, but I, I suggest that you read a lot about them and their work. Um, there's a lot of interviews with them recently. Um, but what they've been trying to expand is not just the idea that police brutality is something that needs to be stopped, um, but that the education system needs to be fixed, um, that the healthcare system needs to be fixed, that every single institution in America is racist and we need to address it. And so I think that's an important point to make as we start to close out. Um, and hopefully one that can lead you to a bit of hope. Um, you don't need to always be protesting, although I think protesting is extremely valuable. You, you, you don't need to go out of your way to address racism. Um, unfortunately in America, racism is insidious and it is in every single institution, it is in every single workplace, it is in every single interaction. Um, and so I just ask of you to think about where in your community and in your networks are you seeing white supremacy and are you seeing racism and where can you start to break down um, those places where you see it in your own community and in your own life um, and find your lane um, to do that and I think to, to combat it um, because unfortunately it is always right in front of us and we can we can address it in so many ways um, so I will leave you with that um, if you liked tonight's talk um, and you want more history, um, you can follow Roots to Revolution on Instagram and I'll share this link. Um, we run two six week courses where we go over a lot of this history in a lot more depth. Um, and we have two courses starting um, one on August 17th or one on September 28th. And the course is designed so you can learn the history but then also develop an action plan um, for how you can become an activist in your community. And, and we, we work and support you through that. Um, I work with, for other women of color um, who are facilitators. And um, we'd be happy to have you if you wanna learn more about history and learn more about this issue. So thank you so much for listening to me for an hour. <laughs> I feel really honored that you would. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that are burning if you have any. Well, so, so we've gotten several of the same question throughout, and that is, is there a list of any recommended books or other resources? And I've been telling people that, yes, there is. And I'm going to hopefully work with you to, to get something up on the library's uh, Facebook page and website. Um, yeah. So if anybody has more questions about that, then um, keep an eye on our Facebook page over the next couple of days. We'll definitely get something out there for you, um, including Jillian's link. Um, to the uh, Roots of Revolution, uh, Revolution um, website and everything. Yep, yeah, um, I mean, I think one, I mean, it's sold out <laughs> nationwide, I think right now, but Stamp from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi is one that I would highly, highly recommend. Um, if you can't get it right now, um, from a, I would order it from a black owned bookstore. If you can't get it right now, um, he does a lot of TED Talks. Um, I think that's a great one to start with the history. I think any of the people I mentioned in this talk um, that are black activists all have books. So, you know, if you read Frederick Douglass's narrative, um, if you read um, Shirley Chisholm's memoir and Angela Davis, anything written by Angela Davis, um, anything written by the Panthers, um, all the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement have written books. Um, so I think studying the, the voices of black people is really important, the people who are the abolitionists. Um, and I continue the word abolition because we also need to abolish the police and some of the institutions that exist today if we're going to really move forward. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. And in your personal life, you know, to listen to the voices of Black people, whether that be through literature or just in your, in your community. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, as a teacher, have you had to confront uh, suppression or censorship um, from administrators or parents in response to anti-racist or, uh, orientation of your curriculum? Um, have you encountered any difference in your schools, um, things like yeah. that? Yeah, 
So um, I've taught in New York City um, for 13 years. I've taught in the South Bronx and in Brownsville, which is a predominantly um, black neighborhood and Canarsie, which is also a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, and I would say that in my 13 years, I've only taught a handful of white children um, because New York City is the most segregated, um, one of the most segregated school systems in the country. Um, and it is extremely different and radical how those two systems exist in New York um, in a place that's supposed to be progressive. So my administrators have never opposed me teaching this history this way. They've been extremely supportive of it. Um, but the problem is that our, we still have an inherently unequal system. Um, and so I think that when you have that, it's impossible to um, support children in the way they need to be supported, um, both students of color and children who identify as white um, because the classrooms are, are not integrated at all in New York. So that's, that's, been, that's been my experience. And I, I think that is, a, is an experience across the country um, as well. What I will say though about history is education is it's the only um, subject that isn't standardized through the Common Core standards um, and each state gets to choose their own standards. And that is because that if you teach history um, a certain way, you'll probably vote a certain way. Um, and so politicians have a huge stake in teaching history um, with a certain narrative in order to um, maintain their, their power, um, it even has gone as far as people fighting over what is on the AP US history exam um, so that people vote a certain, certain way. So that is something we need to um, fight for. And I think why I'm excited to do conversations like this, um, to bring people together to hear a different narrative that they might not have been taught. And then I think part of the problem too is also that, um, you know, people were not given opportunities for education and black scholarship um, has happened in way larger numbers more recently. And so I think we've reached a point too where um, there's a lot more out there that teachers like me can draw upon, um, even from when I was a child. And, and certainly, you know, when we think about like the 1950s and the 1960s, textbooks were still being written in a way that was extremely discriminatory and that wasn't really that long ago. So I'm hopeful that things can change. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely things can change and you know, it takes, but it'll take all of us working together <laughs> to do it. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this is sort of a two-parter from two different people. Um, what is your definition of racism and um, what does it mean to go out of your way to combat, combat racism? Yeah, so when I, I mean, I probably should have started with that, <laughs> but I think that, <laughs> Like, I don't think of racism as like um, the prejudice that you hold against one other person, right? I think that you can be, um, I think racism is a structure that we've, we've created, right? Um, and so to be an anti-racist is to work on dismantling those structures. Um, so for example, like even if you, like uh, one example that I loved was like in the New Yorker, the woman who reviews restaurants recently, she put out a, a huge spreadsheet of every single black owned restaurant that she could think of in, in New York City. Um, and so that's like a way of being an anti-racist and breaking down structures because she's using her power um, to spread awareness about um, where these businesses could be benefiting. And so I think about like in hospitals, more women of color are likely to die in childbirth um, than white women. We have death, the black maternal mortality rate in America is um, as low as some third world countries that don't have advanced medicine. Um, so if you're a nurse, um, thinking about the way your hospital is treating um, black people, right? There's so many different ways. As a teacher, are you advocating for history curriculum, right? There's so, it's about structures, right? It's not about how, and then of course there is the personal level, right? Um, I'm, I'm not ignoring that, but if we really want to fix America, it's not about a good person versus a bad person, a good cop versus a bad cop. It's, you know, thinking about the, the policing started during the plantation system. Our modern police force is designed after people who were overseeing the plantation system. So that's a structure we need to, to, to take away, right? That isn't about a cop being a, a, a mean guy or <laughs> a murderer. That's a, that's a structure that everyone's a part of. And when you're a part of that structure, 
um, it's really hard to fight against it. And I can speak from that as a teacher, right? As a teacher, it's so hard to fight against the, all the um, inequities that exist, no matter how hard I work. Um, and I think that's what we need to break down. Um, and that's what I mean about racism, my definition of racism. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, so many comments thanking you and, and how, how helpful this was. Um, personally, for me, it was, it was awesome. I really, really appreciate you doing this for us. I would love to have you back um, for another session sometime. It was, uh, it, you know, cramming <laughs> all, yeah, uh, so almost <laughs> all, of, all of American history into, <laughs> into an hour. It's no yes. easy task at all. Um, there's been a lot of great um, uh, posts and comments about um, Sophia B has posted uh, the Instagram handles of uh, black owned bookstores um, to get where to get books. Um, you know, there's a lot of great resources out there and we will definitely be linking to a lot of that on our Facebook page and our YouTube page um, once this goes up there. And so um, if for all you looking for that, then be on the lookout. We'll, we'll definitely get you some more information. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, education is the first step, but please don't stop here. Keep taking action and um, keep supporting your communities. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining and um, we'll hope to see you again soon. All right. Have, Have a great night, night everyone. Thank you so much for joining.